My name is Mary Rain Hull Royer Riley Giffen. <laughs> uh, I was born in my grandmother's house east of Clifton, Colorado in June 11th, 1935. My parents, uh, Esther Emma Tracy Hull, <laughs> was born in Craig, Colorado. Um, her parents lived on a homestead west of Craig, and she had an older brother, baby Earl, who died, and that affected the family, always affected the family. But mom was born then, I assume, I don't know if they had a hospital in Craig at the time or not, but she was born, and uh, her sister, Maud, Tracy was three years younger than she was, and they grew up in on this homestead out in the middle of nowhere <laughs> with very few neighbors. But they learned, to, they did a lot of riding on horses and working with their father on the farm, and they had pretty good upbringing, I think. My dad was born in uh, Dayton, Ohio. He had a sister, so there was just two of them, and that's Aunt Zeta. Um, so Dad grew up, uh, his father was rather abusive, and uh, so when he was 16, he ran away from home and worked in the wheat fields in the north and south of the middle of the country until his dad died, and then he came home. In the meantime, Mom's aunt was working in a sanatorium somewhere in Dayton, and uh, Daddy's friend decided when she was going to go back to Colorado, he decided he would go back, and so Daddy decided that he would join him and go to Colorado to see what it was like in the Wild West, I guess. And uh, so he met Mom then, and I don't know how long they knew each other before they got married, but they got married, and um, evidently when I was born, I was, we must have been living with them, with Grandpa Tracy. I was born, I assume, at Grandma's house, and the first thing that I can remember, I was a little kid, uh, I remember the pigs, Grandpa's pigs got loose, and Daddy had my dad was building a house for us, just south of Grandma's house, and uh, uh, we planted a row of trees, and I guess Grandpa's pigs got loose and killed, got all but one of the trees. So that tree grew to be a really big, tall tree, and that was always my tree. We had another smaller tree that my brother had, and so we spent a lot of time climbing trees. <laughs> um, Charlie was, my brother Charles William Hull was born um, May 12th, 39. <laughs> he was four years younger than I was. Because I can remember because I went up and spent the night with Grandma, in, in the bed with Grandma, while Charlie was being born and down in the house that Daddy built just down south of Grandma's house. So I can kind of remember him being born. <laughs> And I don't remember. I know that when he was little and moving around, and so uh, I taught him to crawl. He was on the floor, and so he had something he liked, so I took it away from him so he could go get it. And so I <laughs> taught him how to crawl. I started school at the Clifton School in first grade. And as it turns out, uh, there's about eight of us that started in first grade there. and. Quite a few of us are still alive, um, and we have a reunion so far every year, which is really good. We get to with the people that we knew when we were little. When uh, I started school, my mom must have walked me to school. I didn't have any much of any contact with anything but one girl that used to come and play with me some, and. Um, Turned out her father was working with my grandpa. But um, mom walked me to school the first day, and it's a long 
railroad track and along the viaduct west, east of Clifton. And the rest of the way was walking along the highway. Well, I think about now a six-year-old kid walking on a half mile on a highway going to school, and I don't think they let little girls do that anymore. There's so many things that happen, and you know, you have to be so careful now. And But I never had any contact with anybody. I just walked to school in the back every day. And uh, But the first day of school I got there, and I can remember standing at the window looking for my friend, because I did because I thought she she was the only one I knew. And uh, and she didn't come, and it turned out she was a Jehovah's Witness or something, and she didn't go to school with us. And so I, we had the other friends in that we got acquainted with, but it was interesting that I can remember standing at that window looking for her. <laughs> it's funny the things you remember. The Christmas vacation, uh, we moved to Gateway, Colorado. Now, my dad evidently didn't have much of a job, and he got this job at the mill. There's a vanadium mill in Gateway, and he was working at that vanadium mill. And I can remember going in and seeing him and watching him pour the hot molten stuff down from <laughs> into the cauldron where it was supposed to go. Now, this is just a sneaky hint of which I think what happened. Gateway is just on the river with Yerevan, Colorado. Yerevan is where the uranium to make the atom bomb came from, and they say that it came from Yerevan. But I have a sneaky feeling that they had that you know, in Gateway, and I really do think that that was where it came from instead of the Yerevan mill, because Yerevan was a vanadium mill also. If that was the case, <laughs> I got to see something really firsthand that nobody else ever saw, or that nobody that's alive ever saw. When we first went down there, we didn't have a place to stay, and Daddy had made arrangements with the, some people by the name of Vaughn across the creek in Gateway. Um, and so Charlie slept at one end of a cot, and I slept at the end of the cot for until summertime came, and summer Daddy bought a tent and put out a tent, so we lived in a tent. Uh, then the rest of the time we lived in Gateway. We've been there, I think, about two years, and well, less than two years, and Daddy got a job driving truck. Well, he was a truck driver, and he was really good. And um, so he wasn't working at the mill, and they closed the mill down, and they never ran the mill again. And I just, <laughs> to me, it's, it just makes me think that something was going on with that mill. He left Gateway because Daddy had lost his truck driving job. They weren't using the mill anymore. And so we moved back to Clifton. Um, I don't know what kind of a job he had there, but uh, this is after World War II started. And my dad was, um, because he had changed jobs. The draft board went after him and called him into the Army. He w went in when he was 35 years old into the Army, went to Ke Camp Roberts in California. Um, he came home once then and then went back to Camp Roberts. And because of he was a good truck driver, they told him that he could be an instructor. So that was what he was planning on doing. Well. At the end of World War II, they threw everybody they had into Germany. And uh, so they put him on a train. He went past our house <laughs> on the train, went to New York, and uh, was there for a while, and they shipped him out to Germany. And so my dad was 36 years old in Germany as a soldier, and I don't no, too much. It seems like him talking about the one time he and an Indian man um, were sent out uh, to spy on something, to check things out, because my daddy had hunted deer and and the Indian was a trained Indian, so they went out and 
seems like they blew up something. I'm not, I don't know much more about that story, but uh, but it's a real worry when you're eight years old and your dad's in the war and you hear the news all the time on the war. And, and I've got the letters that daddy and mama wrote to each other, which I, I hope that my kids <laughs> will appreciate sometime. We got one letter back uh, missing in action, so they didn't know where he was. And it turned out he'd always been unhealthy, had lung problems and stuff, and so being in a foxhole in Germany wasn't too good for him, and he was really bad shape, so they sent him in to be checked out, and he ended up, he was in the hospital in Paris, so he was in a good place there. <laughs> And I've got pictures, a picture that um, he sent a, on a postcard from Paris. But we were really happy to get news because we got one letter back missing an action. And so <laughs> we well, thought he was gone. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't have electricity when he went away. I, he was pretty good, so he had put in a system, his own electrical system, so that we had lights in the house, but we didn't have anything else. Uh, just right at the end of the war, the power company put in electricity and mom got the electricity put into the house, so we had electric in the house. And somewhere along the line, we got a telephone also. <laughs> but the electricity, you know, kind of hard living without electricity and most people now wouldn't be able to but uh, of course we didn't have electricity in the tent either so <laughs> want to know the story about living in a 20 by 20 house with four people <laughs> and uh, for years I slept on the couch next to the wood burning stove wood and coal burning stove in the living room and so somewhere along the line I decided I wanted to change. So I made a deal with my brother <laughs> that we would change rooms. And I don't know why he finally agreed with me, but I got to move into the, actually it was a big closet and the closet was catty corner across the room with a cot underneath. And, uh, and <laughs> the bed was there, was fine that was next to a big window and my mom figured we had to have the window open winter or summer winter or summer so in the winter it got kind of cold with wind coming in the window and uh, so we had a dog tippy and we had a cat and i don't know if the cat had a name but anyway probably had different cats <laughs> but anyway i spent a lot of time in the winter with the dog sleeping at my feet and the cat sleeping in with me or the other way around. So the cat and the dog kept me winter warm. <laughs> so, so that was my bedroom. And uh, yeah, it had an attic and we used to go up and play in the attic. I don't, I think we did things up there that mom and daddy didn't know we did, but we'd go up in the attic and play sometimes. You had to climb up through the closet to get to the entrance into the attic. But yeah, we had, we got along fine in our little house, but it was small. And it, but uh, I still think about sleeping with my nice cozy dog and my cat. <laughs> When Daddy was in the Army, before he went, you know, he tried to teach Mom how to cut the heads off of chickens. I mean, you got it. You got to get your chicken some way, and that was one of our major food supplies. So um, maybe Grandpa came down and helped Mom, but then he left her to do the thing. So she mishit a chicken that ran around without its head for a while. <laughs> that was kind of interesting. <laughs> But anyway, she finally got so she could cut the heads off the chickens, but it was really hard for her to do. We always had a garden of some sort. Oh, it's just something I've always done. We always bought milk. We must have had milk when I was little from Grandpa's cows, but I don't remember. I know. And we lived across the railroad and across a space by the viaduct and a store, so 
uh, mama give us a quarter, we'd run over and buy a quart of milk. So, so milk was pretty reasonable. And so we always drank milk, you know, we always had milk. But, uh, and we must have had chicken and I don't know what. Oh, and then venison, you know, because when daddy came home, he always managed to get a deer. And so we had venison. Uh, we didn't ever, as far as I know, have beef. <laughs> Maybe it must have had some pork, because I guess Grandpa had pigs, but I don't even remember having much pork. We had a locker at Pond's Market in Clifton where we kept our venison so that we had venison to eat year-round. <laughs> we started into school, and uh, uh, the people that were in our class, Newton Burkhalter joined while I was gone, so he wasn't one of the ones that I started school with, but we continued on, this whole group of us continued on. Um, Mrs. Crane was our fifth grade teacher. I don't remember the fourth grade teacher. A sixth grade teacher was Juanita Shaw, who was also the girls' PE teacher. <laughs> and it was fun having a PE teacher be in your class teacher because we got to do like games and stuff too. I missed in the total years of school, I think I missed six days. And those six days, we had teacher's vacation. I think it's in October, or maybe it was. We had teacher's vacation, so we had two days off. And so that's the day that we would go hunting. So Charlie and I went hunting with mom and daddy two times. <laughs> and so that's my six days I missed of school. And I'm never, ever sick, you know, always extremely healthy. But one summer I was feeling bad. I had a high fever. And I don't know what it was, but I had a high fever. And Dr. Wideline was this old time doctor. And my grandpa was quite sick. And so Dr. Wideline had come to see my grandpa. And I was had this fever, so we stopped the doctor. Went, best our house to grandpa's and then we stopped the doctor and he came in and I don't even remember he gave me any medicine but <laughs> but he knew I had a fever but as far as I know that's you know I'd have colds but that's the only thing I ever remember that was wasn't normal <laughs> we started into um, junior high it was the first year that um, Central High School was formed and the the junior high which was uh, Fruitvale, Fair Park and Clifton at the Clifton School and that was our uh, junior high school and so we joined with a bunch of other <laughs> kids for the and we we played baseball tournaments and we played I can't remember a whole lot about <laughs> what all we did in junior high, but uh, I was always a pretty good student. And we, we had, Newton and I used to have competitions, and later on Max Giffen joined in the competition, so the two classes, uh, but, uh, and the Central High School was in, in Fruitvale, Colorado, which is about halfway to Grand Junction, and so we had to ride the bus. We were a good class. I mean, we all took care of each other, and. Uh, we had <laughs> only time I ever got in trouble. Walked into an English class one day, and there was Boo Cochran. His name was Co the teacher on the board. Well, that made Mr. Cochran kind of mad because he was pretty easy to get mad anyway. <laughs> and so the bell rang, and so we all got up and left. And I said, you know, I wouldn't have turned him if I'd have knew who did it. And and Mr. Cochran heard me. He grabbed me. He kept me in there and yelled at me for a while. <laughs> he was trying to figure out what to do with me. Everybody else was in math class and I was in getting yelled at for, for uh, I don't know who broke Boo Cochran on the board. I think Gordon told me it wasn't him, but I don't believe that. <laughs> Max was in the Fruitvale group when, uh, when they joined us, or we joined them in Fruitvale <laughs> and in junior high. And, uh, so we uh, we were a good class, I think. You know, we didn't get into too much trouble. I mean, 
Gordon had to liven things up for us. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we had the proms and the dances and we had graduation. And if there was a party, it was at Florence Roos' house, which is right next to Max's house. <laughs> and and uh, so we had a, a party at Florence's house that night. The uh, school system and the school would not open if, if Peach Harvest was late because they needed all the students to be the workers for the Peach Harvest. So we all worked, while I was in high school, I was also in 4-H and I did a lot of, uh, mostly sewing. I was in foods, but I wasn't too good at that. <laughs> but uh, I need, made a really nice wool suit, uh, my sixth year of sewing. And in order to get the money to buy a suit, I picked cherries over Fruitville. Somewhere I picked cherries to make the money to buy the material to make my suit. And Charlie went along to work and he picked enough cherries to get five cents. <laughs> he wasn't much of a worker. He was a thinker. I guess he was always a thinker more than a worker, you know. But uh, yeah, so. So mom had that nickel that she gave Charlie for his pay for work picking cherries. But I made 50 some dollars uh, to buy my material and so I made the suit. It was a grand champion sewing suit <laughs> the year that I did that. And also I was in leadership because I had helped other people in the classes. Yeah, I've, I've invested a lot more time in 4-H than I did in high school, but okay. When I graduated, I was a valedictorian, and that really upset Newton, because he was wanting to be there. <laughs> but he didn't quite make it. But, and I never worried about it that much. <laughs> but I was, yeah. So I did get good grades in school. I've got the copy of it somewhere. <laughs> I don't remember where. <laughs> I've got the speech that I gave. When um, I started into Mesa College, uh, our paper boy was uh, the photographer for the Daily Sentinel. And so he, every chance he got, he took my picture because before he became <laughs> a photographer, he was our paper boy and he always brought a paper. So. Every time there was a picture to take, he ended up taking my picture. So I've got several pictures of me. I guess the first year you more or less <laughs> study the normal, everything, English and stuff. Uh, I was interested in science, uh, but uh, I didn't take anything particular other than English and reading, <laughs> you know, the normal things that you take the first couple years of college. After uh, Christmas, my friend Shirley Strankman, which was from Grand Junction, and she I, she was my friend because she was in 4-H with me and we knew each other really well. Uh, she and I were standing talking and these two guys went by. And I looked at one and I said, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna go with him. <laughs> and it was Ted. Ted didn't go to school the first quarter at Mesa College because he'd gone to CU and he did it was too big for him because he was from a small, small school. So I saw him and I stopped and talked to him, I guess. But uh, yeah, about the day that school was over on his 18th birthday, we got married. <laughs> and uh, that was at the end of school. And, and then we start a whole new story. We got married and we went to Norwood, Colorado. Uh, first thing we did was buy a trailer house and set it up up there in Norwood. So we lived in the trailer. It was a used trailer, but it had a lot of. It was pretty handy. It was a pretty good one. And uh, so, uh, first thing you know, I was having a baby. <laughs> and uh, I don't know exactly what all was wrong, but anyway. Ted wasn't really happy with the situation, so he 
took the trailer and me down to Grand Junction, and I was in Grand Junction, and had uh, baby Glenn in the hospital in Grand Junction, and uh, my folks were there, and his folks were there, and he wasn't there. <laughs> but he finally got there. <laughs> but we had, Glenn was a really good little baby. You know, he was, he was just a really good kid. And, uh, you know, I could go here, uh, baby after baby after baby, but uh, <laughs> I only had five kids in six years, so, <laughs> so I was pretty busy with little kids. Yeah, I never even held a baby until <laughs> I had my own. I'd never babysat or, you know, I didn't even know my, anybody that had little kids, hardly. Sometimes I play with little kids, um, but I'd never held a baby. <laughs> I don't know, I think I was just doing what I needed to do, because he, I nursed him, you know, and he liked that. <laughs> Yeah, but um, in the meantime, Ted signed up, volunteered for the draft. That's an, we're not talking like '56 when young men just automatically were either drafted or. But he volunteered for the draft, so he was in uh, San Antonio, Texas, and uh, I don't know how long. And I was in Grand Junction in the, but. Um, he called and wanted me to come down there. So I had a girl across the street. She said she'd drive with me. So we drove the car, loaded up the car. We rented, supposedly rented the trailer to somebody, which didn't turn out to be too good, but we, yeah. So we rented the trailer to somebody and made the trip to San Antonio. And uh, we didn't have any problems, we just drove along. And didn't have any trouble and uh, as soon as we got there she needed to get back you know so we sent her on the bus to go back and uh, Ted said he thought I was so beautiful and his son was so beautiful and he was really impressed when we got there <laughs> and so we were there several months until he got through with his training that he had there and he uh, got transferred to El Paso, Texas. In the meantime, I was pregnant. <laughs> I was, and uh, so we went to Grand Junction and got our trailer, took it back down and parked it in um, a place in El Paso. And we were there when Eric was born in the William Beaumont Army Hospital. And uh, um, anyway, his head was fairly large, and I don't know if they thought he had a problem or what, you know, but we never did know because it turned out that he had cerebral palsy. So I thought the doctor, well, I had tried to push him out, you know, I had tried, and they hadn't told me, don't do that. And so I've always wondered if that was the reason of his cerebral palsy was because in the birth process he's got his head damaged somewhere. So, but I don't know <laughs> that that's what it was. But uh, Glenn was always such a good brother. <laughs> he took care of, <laughs> you know, he was happy with the baby and stuff. We were in uh, El Paso then quite a while and we did I went over to Mexico, first time I got into Mexico and seen what the streets were like and stuff. Um, we had friends, you know, different people that he, that Ted had, knew it in the army, you know, we had friends and we did a lot of stuff. And um, so, he got his two years out, so we we're talking, and we took our trailer and headed up to Colorado with it, and we got down in New Mexico and had trouble with it. And I guess somebody finally went down and got it and brought it up. But uh, 
we moved into a rental house then and we didn't have to live in our trailer anymore <laughs> but we moved into a, a middle a pretty nice rental house and um, now we continue on the town of Norwood somewhere along the line well I was pregnant again <laughs> and somewhere along the line somebody set a fire or blew up or did something to the Norwood clinic and the people that did it nobody ever said they did it but everybody thinks they knew who did it but it I mean in a small town <laughs> We saw this one guy running around doing unusual things, and, and so we thought that he was probably the did it, but they blew up the clinic. And it was about time to have a baby, and sure enough, uh, I <laughs> went into labor, and uh, the doctor didn't think I had time to get to Montrose to deliver the baby, so it, uh, David was born in the Norwood Clinic at just two or three days after the clinic blew up. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that was one of the interesting things about Norwood. <laughs> I guess after that we moved in to Grandma Royer's house on Main Street in Norwood. And uh, we had a big bedroom or a bedroom in the front and then the bedroom in the back we ended up with bunk beds. Yeah. Yeah, so um, they had Glenn and Eric and Glenn on the top and Eric in the bottom, and then David was in the baby bed, <laughs> which is the baby oh, bed sorry. we've got here. <laughs> when we uh, ready to have the next baby, we went to Grand Junction. <laughs> I'm trying to think. We hadn't, I don't think we had moved down there yet, but we went down to Grand Junction and delivered the baby at the Osteopathic Hospital in Grand Junction. My mom went to work at the Postal Service. Uh, Jamie Grant, the postmaster that had been the postmaster as long as I'd known, <laughs> been there, he came and got mom and took, told her to come to work for him. So with daddy working and mom working, they were able to get a fairly nice house on a street in, in Clifton. So we've got Glenn and Eric and David. Now we've got Bruce, <laughs> who was kind of a chunky little baby and he kind of muscular. I mean, you know, for a little baby, I think. But anyway, so then we had him uh, in time. What was Ted doing? I think he must probably have still been working for his dad. But so, yeah, so Bruce was born in there. And then a year later, Curtis was born in the osteopathic hospital in Grand Junction. They didn't very seldom have trouble. You know, they didn't fight or stuff. And we just always had fun. <laughs> yeah, um, I enjoyed having, having my sons, they were, they, come up and grab me every once in a while and give me a hug. <laughs> and uh, and I don't know, uh, being around you and your little girl, I just said I missed out having a little girl because <laughs> that's different. <laughs> but uh, I got along fine with my kids and I so appreciate Glenn. He was so good at uh, working with the other kids. He did a lot of the job of taking the care of the little kids. We decided to go back to college because I had one year and he didn't have any. So we loaded up and went to Gunnison, Colorado to go to college. And I was taking science, I was a chemistry major and the teacher was the head of the science department. and. Um, Sometimes I didn't have anybody to watch Curtis, so the head of the science department babysat him while I went to class, <laughs> and that was Dr. Lawrence, and they were the people that introduced us to the LDS Church. Uh, the, Dr. Lawrence, his wife was a school teacher. She was 
taught one of the kids in one of the grades. She taught school, and Dr. Lawrence was in the college. And we saw this morning, he's joined in the Boy Scouts. That was in Gunnison. And, uh, but they didn't have Boy Scouts other than a church. So the, under the church has a Boy Scout program. So they were in, in the Scout program at the church. While it is there, we didn't have, you know, I didn't have a job and he didn't have, I mean, he did, he had a job for this one, uh, people that were doing logging, you know, and so he was working in the woods. Uh, he was taking Glenn up with him to help him do stuff. Uh, Ted took Glenn to the woods one day and he came back and called and said he was at the hospital and something had fallen and hit Glenn. And I don't think he knew he was dead yet then, but I went up to the hospital and Glenn died. And uh, so the Lawrences took us under their wing. <laughs> and involved in in uh, the funeral and everything. But anyway, as we spent time with the Lawrences and, uh, and the kids, I don't know how the kids ever put up with it. I didn't let Curtis even go to the funeral because he was still, I didn't think he was old enough and it was bad enough for me to worry about my kids. <laughs> yeah, so um, we ended up staying in Gunnison and graduating there. Both of us graduated. Uh, but we did join the church. Uh, I don't remember if it was real soon, but it, we, we fought it for quite a while. <laughs> You know, we had the lessons and all this, but uh, it, it just meant a lot to us to join the church. So we joined the LDS Church and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. <laughs> and uh, so we kept on until we graduated and then we moved to Grand Junction. I don't know how we afford it, but we got a nice house on Orchard Mesa. and. And uh, so the kids, by then, Curtis was probably in kindergarten or first grade, something like that. Ted was in accounting, yeah. So he was graduated as an accountant, and so we got a he had got an accounting job, and I got a school teaching job. <laughs> I didn't do too well as a school teacher. <laughs> Everybody, I guess, I, I was teaching uh, science. To seventh graders and it reached the point where mostly what I had to do was trying to keep track of all the equipment that everybody kept trying to steal you know <laughs> and uh, it was a pretty informal class and so we I got through one year and the second year they didn't let me have science again they put me in as a math teacher and a girls health teacher and uh, the math they had decided it was some kind of a thing they were going to teach slow kids algebra <laughs> so here i was trying to teach algebra which i wasn't too good at to kids that couldn't add and subtract and divide i mean they couldn't do math and it was just so frustrating trying to teach non-mathematic people trying to teach them algebra when they didn't know ordinary math. Uh, my girls and girls' health were the eighth graders that I was taught at seventh graders, and they liked me. You know, they were fairly, they were good, they liked me. And things kept happening, and so one day I couldn't find my purse. I thought somebody had taken my purse. It was coming on Christmas. Uh, and I later found my purse, and it didn't have anything to do with the kids. But in the meantime, I turned in my resignation. So I didn't go back after Christmas. They hired a teacher, a math teacher, to teach the science kids. I mean, the math kids try to teach them algebra, and she says, there's no way this is going to work. <laughs> so she didn't teach them algebra either, because it was, you know, I don't know who thought that the kids who were slow in math 
could understand algebra. You know, it didn't make sense. But <laughs> so I didn't work again for a while. <laughs> but we did have a, a comfortable house, a nice house, and we had neighbors that we got along with real well, and we did liked it really well on on Orchard Mesa and. Curtis had Murray Brown, the Brown kids were Curtis and Bruce's friends, you know, they had, they had friends and they got along good there. We were pretty well set in Grand Junction, but once I didn't have my paycheck in, we were probably in trouble trying to make the house payments and I don't know about how much Ted was making. But we also found out that the ranch house in Nor was uh, was available, that nobody was living in there, and so we closed up in Grand Junction and moved our family to Norwood. And the advantage of Norwood was it's a lot smaller school. I had athletic sons that had an athletic father that took part in all the sports activities, and it really made it. A better move for the kids because it was a good place to go, where they had grandmas and aunts and uncles and friends for years, and so we were really in good shape when we moved to Norwood, and the kids fit right in at school, and because they knew people there and everything, so we got along fine, and um, on top of that. I heard that there was an opening in the post office. Well, my mom having retired from the postal service, and I knew that was a good job, and I thought, well, might as well try. So I applied at the post office and got the job. And it, it was a job was in the county, running the county, uh, putting the mail out, and just a normal post office job. And. Um, it was the start of the longest time that we ever stayed in one place because we ended up staying in in Norwood more than 12 years. When we moved to Norwood, Ted decided the house, the house, old house, was on the corner that we had lived in years ago. But Ted decided to build an office building, so he built an office building on the corner lot. Um, to I had contractors and they built it, a two-story office building, and he had his office up in the top of the corner so he could see what all was happening around town. <laughs> and so that building has been an important building in in Norwood. David is in there now with his business of surveying and the work that he does, and so he he and Patty live upstairs in the office building. Uh, they don't have, they have offices, but they, they haven't rented out many offices down on the lower floor. It just gives them more room to put things. <laughs> but uh, so the office building is still there and it's being used by a royer. <laughs> While living there, I had my bees. I bought I went down to see Charlie Roberts, an old man from Natarita that had had bees, and I was interested in having bees. So I went down and bought a hive of bees from Charlie, and he showed me how what to do and how the um, hoods and everything that you wear. <laughs> anyway, I got all set up and with my hive of bees, and. Um, never did have any real problems with them. It was really fun. It was interesting. Uh, in fact, I'm planning on helping somebody with their bees here and see how, if I still like it as well. But I was fully equipped. I'd get the, um, could put the hives together and, and do the whole thing. And I, I just really enjoyed working the bees. and. And the people in town liked it fine because I was selling a gallon of fresh honey for twelve dollars. That was a wrong thing to do. <laughs> I probably should have been charging more for my honey, but uh, it worked out really good. In fact, one Fourth of July, somebody called and said they had a bunch of bees in their tree, and uh, 
So I went and uh, climbed up in the tree and I was getting the bees out of the tree and the local newspaper had the message so he came and took a picture of me in the tree getting the bees. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, so that was in the paper. Got to see, and I don't think I saved the picture because I haven't ever seen it. But I did get a picture of myself in the tree taking care of bees. But uh, I had, I just really enjoyed it. But uh, sometimes I run out of time, and, and uh, so one day I needed to get some work done on them, and I went out and got it open and took care of the bees, but I didn't close up the hive. So I decided, okay, I remembered that evening I hadn't closed the hive and I really needed to go out. So I went out there and I didn't have, I had a flashlight and I couldn't, you know, <laughs> couldn't get Ted close to the bees. <laughs> and anyway, so I held the flashlight in my mouth <laughs> so that I could see what I was doing and this bee took a zoop and stung inside my nose. And that was rather painful. <laughs> I just as soon have not had that happen, but that I I don't think I ever got stung. It was fine if you just work slow and calm and and don't worry about it. The bees put up with you fine. <laughs> I really enjoyed the bees. <laughs> yeah, I don't know where we got the rabbits, but we had rabbits back by the chicken house because we did have chickens part of the time, and. Uh, so rabbits have baby rabbits. <laughs> if you don't do something with the rabbits, you end up with too many rabbits. So uh, Bruce volunteered to butcher the rabbits because we like to eat them. And the other kids, nobody ever volunteered. So Bruce was the one that got to butcher the rabbits. And so finally, I guess he let me know that he wasn't really happy about butchering rabbits either. <laughs> but so we finally let the rabbits go. But I like to eat rabbit. It worked out pretty good. We're living out there where the deer are. <laughs> yeah, so they, and Ted, Ted always went hunting. And they didn't ever get elk or anything. It was just venison. And well, that's what a lot of our food from when I was a kid to when we were married was the venison that we had, which is, I like fine. <laughs> But then the kids would go hunting with Dad some, and I guess some of them still go hunting. I don't know which ones. I imagine David goes hunting. Yeah, I think he does, and I think Bruce does too. It was like I think it's 15 acres, you know. And we didn't, we didn't run the cows. We would lease. People would come and put their cows in there. We didn't, we didn't <laughs> do anything as far as the, as the land. But we had the house and we were comfortable. And, and uh, the school got really exciting as year was went by. And uh, Bruce was on the wrestling team and Curtis was uh, played basketball and David played basketball. And, and, and David and Bruce, well, I guess Curtis, they all played football. And so, you know, it was, it was really, a fun life. I don't know, I guess each kid kind of had to do some, you know, had to take care of, clean up his spot, you know. Uh, yeah, I was working. I, it didn't ever bother me too much. Like, especially in Norwood, I wasn't working full day. So, uh, I never was a really good housekeeper. So, <laughs> people that want housekeepers uh, want to be a good housekeeper. I guess they don't want to have a bunch of kids, but uh, and a lot of people that do have a bunch of kids really do keep good houses. But we tried to be comfortable, <laughs> yeah. and uh, didn't have. I don't think. I don't think we ever had too much problem. Uh, sometimes they'd cook stuff. You know, they like to get in the kitchen <laughs> and cook things and. Uh, they always ate well. I didn't ever have to make them eat. <laughs> so, uh, as far as getting along with them, I always got along with them so well. And uh, and Ted did well with them too. Yeah. I think once in a while he spanked them, but <laughs> not. I can't ever remember for what or any real serious problem with them. 
They just got along good. <laughs> and something I didn't say was that, uh, especially Curtis liked to sing and we really enjoyed, you know, because he sings well. <laughs> and, uh, and we, the others, I think David, he's, <laughs> he never did get around to singing. I think Bruce and Curtis did singing and Eric sings also. Uh, nobody, let's see, musical instruments. Uh, Curtis was in band. I think he played the tuba, you know. <laughs> uh, but Bruce didn't take band. So Curtis was the only one that was really musical. We tried to be square with the church, you know, pay our tithing and, and attend our meetings. Uh, Ted worked, had jobs in the church where he worked pretty good, uh, not as teaching, but in the financial part. And, and, and so he works in the boys. In fact, there were times in the Natarita Ward where Ted and Eric would bless the sacrament and the other three boys would pass, pass the sacrament. So that is always in my mind. <laughs> that was pretty neat. That because <laughs> They did that job, and and they didn't, you know, they knew what they were supposed to do, and they did it. You know, it wasn't nobody forced them to do anything. We just got along. <laughs> the church uh, building is in Natarita, so we had to go drive 20 miles down to church every Sunday, down and back, and. Uh, as the kids got through high school and they started going off on missions. So three of them went to Spanish-speaking missions. Uh, David went to Venezuela, and at that time Venezuela wasn't near the problem as it is now. Now they're having major problems there. And Bruce went to El Salvador, and Curtis went to Colombia, and I think Colombia was the most disturbed country that they went to. In the meantime, the church officials um, agreed that Eric could go on a mission, but they ended up to send him statewide, so he went to Seattle. And um, we went up there on a trip to see him in Seattle, which we're not supposed to go see the missionaries, but, <laughs> but everybody worried about Eric going, <laughs> and so we, we did go up to see him in Seattle. That was just one of the, we never took very many trips and that's one of the trips we went to, was up there. And uh, at the time he'd been having trouble with his teeth, I think it was, but, but he got it squared away. And, and I think he enjoyed being on a mission. He was probably the most, deli uh, most deliberate in studying and working with it. And then they got out of their mission and started going to college <laughs> and getting married and all that. <laughs> and Bruce had the first grandchild, had Jenny, so she's the oldest of the grandchildren. And uh, then David and Patty had the twins, Chris and Amber. <laughs> well, anyway, things livened up when we started to have grandkids uh, and we enjoyed the babies, and Jenny was a good little girl, and, and so we had a lot of time with, with grandkids. I heard there was an opening in the Blanding Post Office. So I went to Blanding and got into the post office in Blanding. Um, again, it was, I enjoyed the work, especially I like driving out, because we had the mail truck. In Norwood, it would just work the counter, but in Blanding, I got to drive the mail truck around delivering packages and putting mail in the in the mailboxes, and and I really enjoyed that. I figured it helped your uh, concentration if if you don't do the same thing all the time, because I part of the time I was in the office and part of the time I was out on the route. And you get in there with more people, so you have these conversations while you were sorting mail. And uh, I enjoyed working there. I worked 
12, 12 years in Norwood and then uh, in eight years I had been with the Postal Service 20 years and I was eligible to retire. And I don't know, I probably should have just kept working, but, <laughs> but I decided I'd retire. The problem was I was supposed to retire in June, but the guys all wanted to go hunting and so they all made me, they wanted me to stay until October so that I could uh, work so that they could go hunting and have hunting season off. <laughs> So I worked through October that year and uh, and retired. And uh, then I don't remember doing anything particular, but uh, Ted was doing his own business. We moved to Mancus um, and found a little house out in the country. In fact, we were looking at pictures today and there was this house and I couldn't recognize it. And so sure enough, it was the house in Mancos. It was a nice looking house. <laughs> and it was out in the country and we didn't have any close neighbors. And it was just, you know, we never really enjoyed being in too many people, too many too close to us. Wherever we lived, Ted and I always bowled in bowling leagues and we just really enjoyed bowling and that we didn't do much other activity, datings or going out to eat much, but we always went bowling. And uh, we both had decent, decent averages and, and enjoyed bowling against each other and against the rest of the people on the other teams. So that is just one activity that, that kept us together for a long time. And when we moved to Mancus and we started bowling in Cortez, so we kept it up. Ted was looking for a job, and he found this one place downtown makes tilde racks. And uh, so he went to work there as accountant and and got involved in selling tilde racks and doing things there. But he started feeling poorly. I mean, he's had pains in his back and stuff and we didn't know what the problem was. And he was VA, so we went to the VA and uh, investigated and found out he had pancreatic cancer. So um, they didn't send us to Denver because evidently the Denver VA is in really bad shape. They sent us to Salt Lake. So we went to Salt Lake and uh, I'm trying to remember where, where we stayed there, but we had a place to stay. And um, so he had treatments there, and uh, he wasn't, he felt better, but it wasn't good. And uh, they told him that they added maybe three months to his life while we were there. But uh, we went back to Mancus, and, um, and he was, like on the, at the end, sort of, and uh, in order, as he was getting worse, um, I called the kids, and so all four boys came and spent the time with us, and um, yeah, Curtis stayed up with Ted, and I was in the bedroom right next to it, and uh, the other kids were in the other bedrooms. And um, so I heard Ted making noises or something. I got up and went in and uh, saw he was there and Curtis was still awake. And I kissed Ted, went back to bed and it wasn't too long after that. And I heard, you know, he just died. And that was, I know it was hard for Curtis that he had to be the one <laughs> there, but but he was, it was his turn. I mean, they took turns staying, sitting up with him. And uh, so we had our funeral in Norwood and Ted's buried in Norwood and we had Glenn cremated and I wonder why we didn't give his organs to somebody. They do that and I should have done that and I didn't think about it at the time because good, strong, healthy boy bodies, <laughs> you know. <laughs> But we didn't. But anyway, uh, 
David had gotten the, uh, who still lives in Norwood, um, had gotten the, had, from the Nor Mor recently, uh, a couple years ago, Max and I went over and uh, with David and we put Glenn's ashes in the box next to Ted's, on um, Ted's gravesite. So they're together there. He was very smart. <laughs> really smart. You know, lots and lots of ideas. I mean, you know, just really um, came up with things to do and <laughs> how to do them. And, and I think he was a good father. You know, I think he spent time with his kids. He loved cars. <laughs> <laughs> and the kids all love cars. <laughs> we had friends there in Mancus that were pretty good friends, and uh, an older couple. They were older than me anyway. <laughs> and uh, they were coming down to Casa Grande in the winters, and they said, why don't you come down with us? And uh, I didn't know I thought about it. <laughs> so I decided to, because, you know, it was cold and snowy, and we, I had spent, well, the thing of it is, I'd spent one winter keeping the wood stove going over winter, and I didn't like that. <laughs> so uh, I came down with, with our friends, well, I drove down separately, but came down with the friends, and we started going to senior citizens. They went to senior citizens to eat their meals and stuff, and they've got a pretty good program here, so I was doing that, and they had dances every every week, and they had the dances, and so, uh, I got involved in, in the senior citizens there, and uh, we had these two guys. One of them was tall and slim and didn't look like he's in really good shape. <laughs> Another smaller guy, and they both of them like me. And uh, uh, Tom Riley from Worthington, Minnesota decided he liked me too. <laughs> he was the tall one. And uh, so uh, he wanted to marry me and, you know, so we decided to get married and so we got married. We went to Mancus, the, one of my friends in Mancus is Allison, the bishop in Mancus married us. And uh, then we spent we spent four years traveling back and forth to Worthington, and we went to the Rose Bowl Parade, and oh, we traveled around a lot, and we had this nice little motor home, and I was, I really enjoyed driving the motor home, because he couldn't, he probably could have driven, but he turned the driving over to me, so I got to do a lot of fun things, and, and was active in doing things. And, uh, so we bought a house in Vilago in North uh, Casa Grande, and so we had a nice house, and everything was pretty nice. Tom and I were traveling around her when we were living in Casa Grande. Um, we had an invitation to Kelsey and Justin's wedding. Um, <laughs> Anyway, after he went in the celebration, and uh, so I, that sounded like a good idea. That and it turns out that Tom had a niece that lived in the same town as where Kelsey's from. So, so we hopped, and it was in the at the end of the year when we were moving from from Arizona to going back to Minnesota. Um, we loaded up our motor home with me driving, who went to Lancaster, California. And we, we didn't go into Los Angeles, so we went alongside of Los Angeles, and we just drove to Lancaster, California, found no problem, found a place to park. And so I was able to go to the wedding reception and Tom's niece visited Tom while I was at the reception and it worked out just perfect. And when uh, we got ready to go, we hopped in and 
you're going across country in the hills, up and down hills, up and down hills, and the trucks would slow down on the hills and I'd go past them and down hills the trucks would go past me. So we <laughs> leapfrogged with trucks all the way across Nevada and uh, wherever we went. But uh, we had, had a really enjoyable trip and I was real glad that I got to go to the wedding reception and glad that and Tom got to visit his niece because he uh, never had contact with that part of the family very much. So that worked out really good. But uh, Tom really was quite ill. <laughs> and uh, so he was getting worse and we decided we better get him back up to Worthington to his family. So. Uh, one of his sons came down, Pete, they rented a bus. It's a bus for taking people that are sick places. And so they rented that bus and Pete took um, Tom home to Worthington. And I headed out in the motor home, went through, well, up through Blanding or somewhere. and. Um, we uh, and David said that he would drive with me to drive up to Worthington. So David and I drove. Oh no, I didn't drive. David wouldn't let me drive. I drove all the way. I rode all the way to Worthington with David in the motorhome, and uh, we got up there. And Tom was just really right on the edge of it, and so he got to kiss him goodbye and. And uh, and he died, and we uh, oh I got Allegiant Airlines flies into Worthington, and so we got David a ticket to fly back to. I don't know for sure if he flew, flew back to Casa Grande or where he flew, but anyway for seventy five dollars, which was a super bargain. So I got David, and so we had. Tom's car was up there, so I had it to drive, and our um, motorhome was up there. So somehow or other, we ended up getting the motorhome down here, and I drove the his car down. So we had to, so there I was again. <laughs> Mom was in the nursing home. Um, and she was getting weaker, but she was kind of like an ordinary person. <laughs> uh, she's strong. She, you know, her work uh, grew up strong. And uh, so the ladies in the nursing home, if she was disappointed with what she get hold of them and they couldn't get loose. And this one lady said, "That's she's the strongest woman they'd ever had <laughs> because they, she wouldn't let them loose. But I knew that Max, Giffen was in town and he wasn't married. <laughs> so so I called him and uh, this was earlier before Tom died. But anyway, I called and talked to Max some and uh, met him at the hospital where mom was. Once I get to a house, I start planting trees. <laughs> and, and you know, when you live down in Arizona where you plant citrus trees. So sure enough, I planted orange trees and lemon trees. And so I got that house pretty well treed. Um, and it, it, it's a really nice house. And um, so, but after Tom died, um, I was driving down the road one day and I saw this development that was going in and right there was a bowling alley but I was driving down there saw this housing development with a bowling alley and quick <laughs> I'm gonna go in there and talk to them <laughs> so I went in and uh, they showed me the houses and it sounded good to me so I bought a house and the house the it was less than half full at the time that I bought my lot. 
and there was a lot back on the far corner by itself and it turns out it's a bigger lot than most of the lots but it, so I picked that lot so that I picked the lot but I didn't have the house in it or anything yet but I, I hadn't even picked out the house yet then but I bought the lot and I guaranteed myself a place to go bowling <laughs> but then mom in the meantime went ahead and she's she and daddy had it's a major memorial cemetery in Grand Junction and so there's a big site there because my grandpa my grandma my mom my dad uh, who else there's room for me <laughs> without mom even being around you know because I was, was spending time in Grand Junction with her um, you know, visit with her and take her places and doing stuff with her. But, but I was by myself <laughs> again, and so I got hold of Max again. <laughs> so we managed to get married, and we're still married. <laughs> Before we got married, I chose the house that I liked, and I liked the fine, and so they were putting it up. And uh, we um, got it installed, and so we moved in there. And uh, like I said, I moved what furniture I could move into the new house, which is much smaller than the other house. But I left a lot of my furniture in, in the, the Lago house. And um, I got to go bowling. We'd go bowling on on Wednesday morning and Saturday morning and then if we have friends come we can reserve the bowling alley and the family and we can all go down and go bowling so <laughs> I like it fine uh, things are pretty well set up the way I like it but um, Max got kind of tired of it gets quite hot in Casa Grande and it isn't and so we started hearing about north of Phoenix so we made a trip up to Payson and uh, just looked at a few houses and found a house to buy first first thing off the bat. A really nice house with a lot of bedrooms so that all the kids can come visit us. And then not very many of them come in to visit us, but, <laughs> but we, and uh, so we bought the house and um, Still hadn't sold the house in Vilago, but we finally sold the house in Vilago. And Max loaded up all of our furniture and everything from there and brought it up. And the men from the church and the young men came and moved all of our furniture into the house. So I've got all my furniture from um, Norwood and Mancus, all my furniture is in the house here so i'm all all set up with three bedrooms and a couch in a little room so we've got a lot of room so we got to encourage kids and their families to come see us <laughs> and the weather is much nicer in in payson and winter does come and so in the fall we go back down for the spend the winter in in casa grand bowling <laughs> and uh, We've uh, pretty well got it set like we like it. And now this house, we've been doing a lot of different things. We had a water break that took a major investment. And um, the plan is if we get old and we need some money, we can sell this house for us in our years when we're in nursing homes or wherever we are. But in the meantime, uh, it, it's nice up here, but I really miss, we have very little contact. I go to church here, but I have, we have very little contact with neighbors and anybody. And I really miss my friends down in Casa Grande and I miss going bowling, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's, it's a good place and, and we're still doing more work on it and we hope to have it be valuable enough to 
keep us going in nursing homes or whatever is going to happen to us. I needed, I didn't have any soil for a garden, so I had a raised bed made, and it uh, it was nice. I think it cost about two thousand dollars to get it. I thought it was more than that, but I saw it the other day. Uh, build a brick, brick uh, five by twenty place where I can raise some tomatoes and I can raise different things. Uh, it's kind of hard when I come up here on the summer to leave them stuff down there, so my crop this year was, didn't amount to too much, but I do have strawberry bed, and so I've got that. And I've planted trees. <laughs> I've got, they planted me six, the company planted me six trees. I mean, I had that many coming, and uh, one of them, a pomegranate, and uh, Max doesn't like them at all. <laughs> but I got a big lemon tree. I got a, I've got an orange tree. I've got uh, two orange trees, uh, Arizona sweet and a regular orange tree. Um, anyway, I've got six citrus trees, and I got a palm tree that's growing quite nice. Another tree that I didn't even plant that's in the yard they're trying to get rid of, but it's a big tree, so it shades the backyard. And I'm perfectly happy having my fruit, <laughs> my grapefruit. I I give away a lot of fruit to the neighbors and things, but uh, basically I say I reserve the, the grapefruit for me. <laughs> well, I would just as soon stay in a house uh, now this is one thing about the place in Casa Grande. We have all of our friends, but all of our friends get older and people die. <laughs> and that and that's what happens in life. And that's be perfectly happy with me, just stay home and go bowling and die with a bowling ball in my hand. I don't care. <laughs> so if you could have like caregivers come in to your yeah, house, yeah. Then that would be the preference. Yeah. Yeah. So we don't know what we're going to do. Uh, Max and I are both 83, which we think we're doing pretty good at that age. Uh, but uh, one never knows, because things can happen, happen really fast. But um, And I know that the church people church from here would take care of us or, you know, spend time with us and stuff, but, but we don't have that close of relationship with them as we do our friends um, in Casa Grande. And, uh, and do you want to, do you want to make sure, like if you were to go somewhere, like to a nursing home or somewhere, would you want to make sure you were still always with Max? Mm, yeah. <laughs> I mean, but we never know, <laughs> you know. One never knows what's going to happen to whom and where and why, but... Uh, but Max and I argue sometimes. He thinks I'm <laughs> kind of inflexible. <laughs> he isn't that crazy about bowling. <laughs> but uh, but we get to enjoy each other. Just recently that I've started to have some medical problems and I never had anything wrong, you know. Oop, have babies, it's over, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and uh, never... So now I'm having trouble with my brain and having trouble with my leg and and the sciatic nerve and, and things that, you know, other people have problems with and I just have never had any problems, so I don't know how to handle it. <laughs> I mentioned uh, moving all the furniture from Mancus to our house here in Payson, but the fun part was and the pictures that we were looking at today is all my J-U-N-K in the front yard and I had decorated in Mancus because I had wheelbarrows and wheels and tires, not tires, but metal things. And I saw that and I said, all my stuff, because Bruce went to Mancus and loaded up a trailer. It includes an old iron stove, uh, carts, wheels, <laughs> iron wheels, all this stuff. And so Bruce went and was bringing it down to the house in, in Casa Grande. 
and I looked up and I saw, and he was coming up the road, and I said, oh, there's Bruce and my stuff. And Max looked at that, and he says, all we're gonna do is have junk. <laughs> it was funny. So I've got all my junk around my house in Mancus. No, 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 from Mancus to Casa Grande. And so I've got my iron, iron stove, and I've got wheels, and I've got all this stuff all scattered around, and I think it looks, nobody complains. <laughs> I think everybody kind of enjoys it, but and I enjoy it because that's, well, it's stuff that I've worked really hard to collect all that stuff. <laughs> but it was so funny, Max, I'm just going to have junk. <laughs> hmm, my collection. In fact, I think they're going to show some pictures of because I, <laughs> I've managed to get a really nice collection of, of Indian things, which uh, I've bought. Uh, it's a lot of stuff traveling between Arizona and, and Colorado. I stop at Cameron's store north of um, Flagstaff and find something neat every time. <laughs> and so I've got things. And then Ted bought stuff for me. Uh, I just bought our group from Casa Grande made a trip into, a bus trip into Mexico last fall. And I didn't plan to spend too much money, but they had this one item, which uh, they had two of them, and the other couple bought the first one, and there was one left with the bowls, decorated bowls, and a sign, and so I bought that. That made, me <laughs> that made Max and I happy, because I got some to remember the trip with. The iron stuff, yeah, I mostly collect that when I was in Blanding, and stuff that was available that I would find, that I just collect, and I never did buy any of it. It was just, oh, my iron stove, which is, it's pretty neat. <laughs> the, uh, Ted and I were traveling somewhere up over the hills or someplace, and I saw this old iron stove, and I said, ah, oh, I need that. So he stopped and loaded it. It was heavy. It was a heavy item. We must have been in the pickup. And uh, anyway, got that iron stove. So I'm real proud of that iron stove. <laughs> but And if we'd see stuff, junk, <laughs> we'd s save it. I didn't ever buy any of it. It's just stuff that people didn't want. And I did. Why do I collect old stuff? <laughs> I thought I was going to be able to talk. <laughs> Hard to get through it. I don't know. It's just that so many things in the past are gone. And people don't understand. They don't know. And old iron stoves reminds me of women <laughs> making their meals on these uh, old stoves in bad situations, <laughs> and I don't know, it's just, I like old things. <laughs> I have size, I got work equipment, and things that people don't use anymore. <laughs> and people, that's how people used to have to live. So I collect them. <laughs> <laughs> when we make the trip to the reunion, we stop in Blanding, Utah, and visit uh, Bruce and his family, or his wife, and if there's any kids around. And then we go to the reunion in Grand Junction, and then and then we go to Norwood and visit David, and so that we get to see that many of our kids. And Curtis is in. Um, Mesa, so we call on him quite often if we need anything. He's there to and hops in and does things that we need. And uh, so we don't get to see too many of our kids. Eric is planning on coming down here this Christmas. Uh, I worry about him traveling, <laughs> but he's planning on coming down for Christmas. And 
And Eric and I talk on the phone fairly very often. Now we're getting the great grandkids. Not too long ago, I, ca I counted 19 grandkids and 19 great grandkids. And two weeks later, I had we had twins, a boy and a girl twin, so that made it up to 21. And I, from this particular date, I got two more expecting within the next month. So, <laughs> so by the time. Everybody gets through having, well, each of the grandkids gets through having babies. I'm going to have a lot of posterity, a lot of great grandkids. And anyway, I guess that's part of life and what, you, what you're there for is to keep, keep the faith and keep life going. And so we've got, we're doing our share. <laughs>